and thank you for joining us here on PM Express. In the last uh, one week, there's been a lot of talk around the intemperate language and politics. It has been sparked by John Mahama's pronouncements that the 2024 elections at the polling stations will be a do or die affair. But that sounds pretty familiar. That's not the first time we've heard leading political figures use such language that is roundly condemned. The question to ask is what really is the impact of those pronouncements? Is it rewarding for politicians to use those such language as we are about to explore? Because I wonder, um, is it because it's rewarding that the politicians keep doing it? We have a whole institution like a very reputable a media foundation for West Africa that have spent a lot of resources tracking such intemperate language over the period. And it's, um, it hasn't appeared, if you look at their own chart, that even the naming and shaming is helping. There must be a correlation, or is there, between such incendiary, intemperate language and the politicians' view that, that that is how you governize a base, that is how you win at elections. Is that what it really is? Is it rewarding? And why do they keep doing it? And what is the impact on the body politic and the democracy such as ours? Um, some have said that, listen, Ghanaian democracy is very strong and solid. No amount of intemperate, incendiary language can destabilize it. Um, is that really the case? We're going to look into that. All these questions we need to be interrogating um, instead of just looking at one pronouncement, putting the bigger context. The big picture here is what we're about to explore. And so let's go to some of the most memorable intemperate language on, made by leading figures on both sides. This do or die by John Mahama last week, pretty similar to Akufado's all die be die, correct? And that generated a fair bit of condemnation too, um, and this has as well. Both parties stood by it, explained it somewhat, and went on with their lives. It's as if that's what we are doing again with this latest pronouncement. Now, John Mahama has refused to retract. In fact, some chiefs in the Shanti region and party supporters are buying into the campaign message. And this is key. Today, we've heard from John Mahama's tour in the Shanti region. There are party foot soldiers, the rank and file supporters who say the do or die comment for them is their campaign mantra for 2024. And they're excited by it because it shows that they're going to be vigilant at the polling stations. So it works, does it not, in galvanizing your base? It definitely, it definitely works. Because you cannot win a, an election without your core base. If your core base isn't as excited, forget about getting the middle class that will decide the elections for you. Isn't that why politicians continue to use intemperate, incendiary language because they are rewarded by the voters. So let's flip the switch. We condemn them when it happens, but are we being hypocritical ourselves as voters because we reward it at the police stations? We'll get into that very shortly because this is a pretty complex subject that needs to be examined, why it keeps happening. Now, watch this. When Akufuado made that infamous or die be that or die be die pronouncement. This is just before the 2012 elections. Uh, we know he eventually lost the elections. Is it primarily down to those comments? I don't know. Many, many factors played a role in there, but some definitely believe those comments played a role in that defeat that we saw and that he had to remake and rehabilitate himself after he lost the Supreme Court uh, verdict in 2013 when he held this pretty statesman-like press conference and said, I disagree, but I accept and I'll abide by the outcome of the Supreme Court and called the entire party to respect it. Some say that elevated him and cured this particular pronouncement. And, and therefore, as we see, subsequently he wins elections. There's a lot of permutations there, but he subsequently lost this. So John Mahama had made his pronouncement again. He's defending it. Party folk soldiers, party executives are defending it. What is going to happen in 2024? I don't know. We'll see. But... I go back to Media Foundation for West Africa because they have the, the most credible, um, I guess, tracking of certain language by the two main political parties. And so we wanted to read a bit more meaning to it, into this. And thankfully, Suleiman Abrahma is joining us as well, uh, just to check whether they find that voters, do voters really care? Um, because I guess there's a reason why Media Foundation started doing this naming and shaming to point to political parties who are actually using the, such 
dirty, incendiary, intemperate language because they wanted to, you know, expose them to the voters. Hopefully, the voters will react to that in a way that punishes it. I wonder whether that has had that effect. We'll get to the, the Media Foundation shortly. But if you look at the monitor for 2020 elections, in November, they counted as many as 85, um, you know, indecent expressions uh, related to the politics. And in, in, in December, they counted 63. Now, if you break this down into the various bits, you have unsubstantiated allegations, you have insulting, offensive comments, you have comments inciting violence, and then you have threats and provocative remarks. Now, if you put that, you know, together just to track what the parties were, which party was most guilty, you see that the MPP led quite significantly with 22 of the comments as against the NDC's 14 and the UFP's 5. What happened in the elections? As we saw, the MPP won the elections despite, you know, using a lot of indecent expressions according to the Media Foundation for West Africa. They still won the elections. So you can, can you deduce from this that voters really don't care whether they are party they are voting for is using indecent language or not. And so they are rewarding it instead of punishing it. And so maybe the politicians will take a cue from this and say, yeah, I mean, I use 22 indecent languages and I won the elections. I mean, I must do more of those and not less. We'll talk about that. Let's go to 2016 again. We, we went back to 2016's Media Foundation's report. And then you again find the categorizations, 87 of them, um, just before the, the elections they counted. And again, that's 2016. You look at the MPP again, significant number of the indecent language was by the MPP in, in the 2016 elections. Um, the NDC had 16 of those. What happened in the 2016 elections? The MPP won the elections. Is it to suggest, again, same questions, by the way, that, again, voters reward such indecent language? Um, because really, that is the, the politics. There's only one thing politicians fear public opinion that results in votes. When there's a link there, politicians will back off. And so if you're not seeing a direct you know, consequence of these, of course they will continue to say uh, and use those, that language. We, we want to look ourselves in the mirror here a bit today on the show on PM Express. And then my research desk uh, put this together in a, in, a, in a tabular form so we can appreciate what I'm talking about. So in, that's the 2016 elections. This is MPP, this is NDC. Clearly, NDC has led in both selections when it comes to the Media Foundation's indecent language expressions and still went ahead and won the elections. And so, really, why are we you know, calling John Mahama out? Because it pays. It pays. I mean, so that's what we need to discuss tonight. And I'm delighted to say that I have Suleiman Abrama joining me and, and, and a, a good team of other analysts who are going to join me shortly to really get to the crux and heart of this matter. Stay with me. My guest joining me tonight uh, via Zoom is uh, Suleiman Abraima, is executive uh, director of the Media Foundation for West Africa. Uh, also joining me tonight is Dr. Uh, Kwesi Amachi Bwati. He's a senior lecturer, Department of uh, History and Political Science at the KNUST. Uh, Dr. Bernard Tutu uh, is uh, the uh, political marketing strategist and, 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 and University of uh, Education lecturer also, also joins us uh, via Zoom. Mr. Suleiman Abrama, let me start with you. I, I started by going through some of your fantastic, excellent work that the Media Foundation does. Uh, going into each elections, tracking uh, this incendiary language. And I'm pretty certain that you possibly weren't shocked or surprised uh, by John Mahama's pronouncements, but he's the first of many that politicians, senior politicians have made that you've tracked. Um, I wonder, since you started tracking, um, what surprises you the most about the repetition of it and, and, and put in the context of what just happened? Does it really pay to say well, um, Evans, we, so we started this uh, project in, uh, during the 2012 elections. And I must say that 2012, 2016, 2020, in terms of the political parties, it's always been the MPP uh, in the lead. 
Now, um, given that the NDC won the 2016 elections, um, despite the MPP leading in terms of the number of times or number of incidents that were recorded in terms of abusive language, it is difficult to say that there is any correlation color- between you know, uh, using abusive language the most and then that inuring to your benefit. However, in 2016, 2020, as you projected, again, the MPP was in the lead and they won in both elections. Now, it does appear to me that increasingly what is happening is people resorting to pro-violence uh, language, hard hitting language to prove that they are tough. And it appears that that perhaps is what the followers would want to hear mm. to prove that, well, we have a candidate who is tough. We have a candidate who doesn't fear. We have a candidate who is prepared to go all out. President Mahama by nature, and given that we know him during his uh, days in parliament, and as the spokesperson of the party and so on and so forth, we don't, I don't know him to be somebody who doubles in these kinds of expressions. And indeed, people have said he's shot into fame because at the time people say, look, he's a very nice guy. He doesn't, you know, condone abusive language. He speaks his mind, but in a very refined way and so on and so forth. But since he made this statement... I mean, NDC um, people that I have spoken to, in fact, I've had, I've, I've had a senior person in NDC tell me that, well, the, the President Mahama shouldn't have actually used do or die, and that it should have actually be a do and die thing, because the use of all means that there is an option. And that should tell you the extent to which now party supporters and the basis of the party think that, look, the way to go is to use hard-hitting language. And that could also be motivated by the fact that NDC leads in 2016, they won. ND, sorry, MPP leads in 2016, they won. They lead in 2020, and they win. And so um, I'm not surprised that President Mahama would begin to um, go this route in terms of this course. And if you look at how the party people have responded, it appears that they are encouraging him to even do more. Mm. Um, and uh, well, we can only hope that we collectively can help refine political discourse in this country. Other than that, how far the NPP and NDC have taken us appears not to be enough. And they are perhaps prepared to drag us more into the ditch. Um, Dr. Amachi Boateng, so it, it's obvious to me that the basis of the parties, the grassroots, the supporter base of the parties have something to do with the persistence of this particular, um, you know, culture in our body politic. Do you agree that that is really at the heart of the problem, the need to galvanize the base and the, the, the essence of the base, which is what people, the party leaders need to appease to, and that's why they use these incendiary language. Well, good evening, Evans, and good evening to your viewers and listeners. Actually, um, I've been looking at that all the time because um, if you look at it from the angle of uh, the parties benefiting from such use of intemperate languages and you know benefiting from it by winning the elections, you begin to have doubt. But actually, you realize that it really stirs up the party members, the party's rank and file. Um, in Ghanaian politics, you know, the party people from time to time believe that the leadership should appear tough and very hard generally on the system. We go back and, and, and we can take a look at what um, happened to Dr. Buzia. His own party people felt that he was you know, not tough enough. He was soft. Uh, some people also felt that President Liman, you know, demonstrated some such weak uh, qualities. Uh, not long ago, the late President uh, Mills, too, um, initially, you know, his party accused him of not being tough enough. And, and later that showed, you know, in President Mills' uh, 
languages. And interestingly, it coincides with these political leaders almost all the time operating from opposition. When they are in opposition, then it looks like they need to demonstrate toughness. You know, and I look at it as the, these leaders benefiting from it from two angles, you know, uh, their own fortunes, you know, um, in, in, in the party, you know, they, 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 they sort of um, gain acceptance generally, and also they stir up, you know, the rank and file, the party people. Unfortunately, unfortunately, looking at it from another angle, the extent to which our, our democracy is institutionalizing, legitimating, consolidating, our democracy is becoming the norm that everybody can take for granted. Then you realize that such languages take us out of the you know decent democratic practice because uh, they tend to have the potential to you know destabilize the system. Yeah, but 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 but, but that's but that's but that's one of the things I, I really want to challenge for a second. We've seen it happen across. Nothing really has happened as a result of that in terms of violence. And so, why should they stop? I mean, there is always the fear that it might, but. We've never really actually seen a direct correlation between such pronouncements and, and violence on the ground. Uh, it has got to do with the way one would want to go about measuring some of the violent acts that occur. You know, some people might have been you know, emboldened previously, you know, uh, to act later in one or another way that might have hurt the system. So um, I think it has got to do with you know, how you want to measure, you know, the sort of uh, correlation between such languages and then the outcome in terms of political violence. But generally, generally, it has that potential. I was laughing because, you know, we might not have gotten there. We nearly got there after the 2008 elections. You know, we nearly got there. And any time we go into elections and the, the losing party, MPP or NDC, believes that, their supporters will take to the streets. They take us out of decent democratic practice because elections, like democracy, is also a system of rule, and and there are rules guiding you know uh, uh, the governance of elections. And the moment a political party decides to participate, the understanding is that you know the party has also decided to abide by the rules. It has no place in you know, taking to the streets if, if, if you are not satisfied with the outcome, you go to the courts. So to the extent that we don't do that, then you realize that, you know, during those times, our leaders are placing their interest, and to me, they tend to be parochial interest over that of the nation. Anytime they want to resort to other means other than uh, what is laid down in the rules, regulations, guiding our elections, then definitely they're going up. And in most cases, it veer towards violence. Mm. Uh, let me bring in uh, Dr. Bernard uh, Tutubahene. He's a political marketing strategist. Uh, Doc, so you, you, assuming you have a politician who comes to consult you, what do you tell him in what he says? Be tough or adopt a different approach and, and, and be more conciliatory in what you say? And which of these is the best political marketing strategy. Being tough, it's totally within our political terrain. And, and be honest with me, um, which of these will, 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 will sell a candidate more? And, and be, be honest with me more. Hello, Dr. Boahini, can you hear me? If, if, you're, if you're watching it, if you're watching the relay, please, please turn it off and, 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 and listen to me using the, the Zoom. Yes. Hello, Evans. Yes, I can hear you now. Yes. I can hear you. My line is. Your, your, li your line is pretty clear, actually. So much. Your line is pretty clear. Yeah, what you need um, to do is to put off your television or the or the um, live feedback you're having. Put it off, and then talk to me and listen to me through the Zoom. I can hear you clearly. Hello. Okay, let's try and get that fixed and, and come to Mr. Suleiman Abraima. Mr. Abraima, so the, that point I was making earlier to Dr. Machi Bwating, we often say that Ghanaians 
Um, people look uh, at the I, evidence. I can, I can the concern is why, why, should, why, why should we be so concerned about pronouncements such as do or die? Or all die be die. What, what, what's 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 the fear there? Because I, I get a sense a lot of condemnation, but what really is the fear? Hello, Doctor Brimer. Sorry, Mister Brimer, uh, Suleiman Brimer. I was I was posing that question. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Yes. So the point I was making. Is a gradual pace of normalization of verbal violence. And because it is verbal, we, we seem to say that, well, there's no problem because when we talk about violence, we are talking about, for example, what happened in Tichiman, where people are hit, people are killed, and so on and so forth. But if you look at what happened in the US, for example, um, what happened uh, at Congress, where people mobilize to go and attack people. Eventually, there is this claim that, well, President Trump may have used his Twitter or whatever it is to mobilize them. And so people are even, people even called for his prosecution and so on and so forth. So what I'm saying is, if we begin to say that, well, violence, if only it's verbal, it's okay, then we are actually preparing the grounds. For, that, for the translation of the verbal violence into physical violence, which, as I said, is what we would regard as, as violence. Now, the pattern so far appears that those who are the most abusive ends up being um, among the most popular in their political parties. So if you look at the 2020 data, for example, you would see um, Chairman Wu to me uh, as one of the topmost uh, I mean, uh, persons in terms of abusive language, you would see Abronye DC, you would see Honorable Kennedy a Japan, you would see Mugabe Mercy. Now, these individuals, I mean, apart from Kennedy a Japan, that you would say, well, he has, you know, the power of the elite, he has the money of the rich, and he has the anger of the youth who have been misled over. The, 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 the years by both MPP and DC. And therefore, his messages of, you know, toughness and abusive uh, um, um, language so, sort of resonates with the masses of the youth because, look, majority of them are disappointed, majority of them are unemployed, majority of them are poor. You would realize that you have to be tough, you have to be abusive in your political party to, to get that support from the masses and from the rank and file. Mm. And I'm saying that that suggests a normalization. And in fact, applauding people who are good at being violent orally and verbally. But that, what that would translate into eventually would be when people get used to the, the, the oral violence or verbal violence, and its potency can no longer do anything because then everyone feels, okay, the right thing to do is to abuse, is to attack, is to insult. Then the next level would be who is the most, you know, who is um, more effective when it comes to physical violence. And that is the stage that we all don't want to get into. And that is why we are discouraging the use of abusive language in our politics so that we can focus on issues. Because right now, it seems to me Winning an election perhaps is not determined by the quality of your ideas, but by how much you can abuse, how much you can insult, how much you can prove that you are tough orally and verbally, rather than the quality of your ideas and you know your manifesto and how effective you are in mobilizing people in a civilized way. So that's the danger ahead of us. And as I said, we have to take it up and collectively work towards you know, encouraging civil and decorous discourse when it comes to our political space. I mean, Dr. Marcio Boatin, to what extent does the Ghanaian voter bear responsibility for this? Because from what Suleiman Abrahma is saying, there's almost a reward politically for being the most macho, the most incendiary in your common. There's, there's almost a, there's a, either the parties themselves give them positions we have Kennedy Japan, who is who the party had appointed and the parliament accepted to be the chairman of the uh, interior committee. That's a reward. Abronya DCE is 
a, a, a party chairman for a region. We have um, we have in, in Kumase your own backyard. You have Wun to me who is who is celebrated by the party has a has won a party position. These are the people that were leading in in the media foundation uh, tracker, and their party had won the elections because the Ghanaian voter had them and so voted for them. Um, we have one MP and others who party primaries and led the party's campaign and, and were very successful in the Shant region in the, in the Bono. So I wonder, to what extent does the Ghanaian voter take responsibility for this? Uh, if I was, let's look at this from two angles. One, um, the activities of such individuals who use, uh, you know, this, uh, I mean, unpleasant languages in the political parties, in the context of the political parties, and, 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 and then the party going ahead to win the elections. I don't think uh, we can establish, you know, a, a correlation between the two, simply because um, if you look at the pattern of our uh, elections and then the votes that the presidential uh, candidates of the two parties, you know, um, uh, you know put together, uh, you realize that um, they always need a certain group of people who I will call the kingmakers who are not necessarily party members. Even when the parties lose elect the elections, they, they are able to, you know, gain over 40% of the, uh, you know, presidential votes. So I don't believe that, you know, these people get rewarded at a national level, you know, uh, you know, through the use of these languages. I mean, the data you showed us, I mean, in 2012, uh, obviously, Nanadu didn't win. And, and, and in 2016, if you want to uh, casually look at, you know, among the various uh, factors that might have, you know, propelled them uh, NPP into office, I want to point to what I call the Dr. Baumia factor. You know, he introduced issues into our Ghanaian politics, the lectures, the issues he raised, you know, raised the bar. And I like to believe that Ghanaians I have moved on, and, and I made a similar comment today at another FM station, you know, because I like to believe that, you know, people want development in their lives, and people want to reward the parties that, you know, demonstrate that they have ideas, crystal clear plans to move the nation forward along developmental path. So at a national level, I wouldn't say that, you know, any party gets rewarded, you know, by focusing on such languages, no. But then, in the party, definitely they get rewarded. In the party, they become the heroes, they become the tough guys, they become the strong people. So uh, as, as uh, you know, Mr. Braimer said, you know, they are given specific rewards. And then, you know, he mentioned several of them, and I agree with him, you know, on that score. But I don't think the use of such uh, indecent languages propel them into, you know, uh, national, I mean, heroes. No, I don't think it helped them to win ultimately the presidential elections. No, I don't think so. I mean... Mr. Prime, Mr. Mr. Prime, let me ask you, from all that you've done so far, do you believe the Ghanaian voter care about whether or not they are leader or the person whose face is on the ballot, either an MP or presidential candidate or whoever it is, do they even care about whether they've used incendiary language, uh, inciting language or not? Do the voter care? Well, I, I think to some extent, some people would care, but the people whose votes ultimately will make the decision in terms of um, the majority would not really care. And that is because as a country, we are really dichotomized in terms of the population and sharply divided between MPP and DC, and then you have a few in between. And it is within these divisions that people are no longer interested in the issues, interested in the facts. In fact, you put out there, for example, um, there was a video trending that President Ekufuado had gone to the Volta region to just commission a transformer. And so my colleagues in the office decide to subject the video to fact checking. And it is established that no, um, the, the, the plug was just mounted around a certain transformer. But even the inscription on the plug says, look, the president was there to commission a storm drain and a, a lorry park. You may say, well, why would the president go to a place to commission a, a, a storm drain and, and, and a lorry park? That's fine. But 
it is not factual to say that the president was there to commission a transformer. So they put out the fact that look, the whole video saying that the president was there to com commission a certain transformer is, is, is false. And people, people wouldn't just read, people wouldn't just listen. And all they care about is, look, no, the president was there to do this. Uh, you guys who are putting this, you are, you are doing this because you are MPP people. I share it and some folks are on there to say, look, since when did you become the spokesperson for the Jubilee House and so on and so forth. And my interest is, look, the facts must be out there. Let us debate if it is the fact that we think the president is too high, too big to go to a place to commission a storm rain and, and, a, and a lorry pack, that's fine. So the point I'm making is people gradually, majority of the people appear to care most about their parties and irrespective of what their parties do or say, it is about its right. And it is in both MPP and NDC. And sometimes it is amazing how persons that you think you would, I mean, you would certainly consider these folks are well-read, well-educated. You can consider them to be middle class, to be elite. And they will come defending things that should not be defended because they are bad. But because those things are coming from their political parties, they will do it. And as I said, it is because to get rewarded, to get noticed, you have to do that within your party. And people have done that, you know, as their basis for, you know, becoming famous in their parties. People have done that to get rewarded as board chairman, as ministers or deputy ministers, or getting gotten some other appointments by the president. And so uh, in as much as you may have some decent people who say, look, the country, we need to build it. And to build a country, we cannot do so through insults and through abusive and incendiary language. We must do so by debating ideas. Yes, those people are there, but they are in the minority. Yeah. The majority of the people now, uh, look, either my party, the MPP must be in power, or my party, the NDC must come to power. And whatever it takes for the party to stay in power or come to power, we will do that. And indeed, uh, this, this is almost quoting what a radio station manager told me and a delegation from the National Media Commission in 2016. That, look, we don't care about what people would say. You know, what we want is that our party must come to power. Whatever it takes to do that, we will do that. Recently, uh, um, a friend from the MPP called me for a long you know, um, time talking about what some journalists are doing in the media and the abusive language and so on and so forth. Meanwhile, this was somebody that we cited quite often in the 2012 campaign. Surprisingly, days later, I hear this person on radio and what he's doing is worse than what he's complaining about. So, <laughs> It's, it's becoming a very, a very, very difficult situation. But if our leaders in both parties begin to, you know, show the way in terms of civil, decorous, you know, discourse, debates on the basis of ideas, I believe that followers will begin to uh, follow um, um, take a cue from that. But mm. if our leaders also decide to go down the path of these foot soldiers and party followers, then we are in control. I mean, let, let me bring in um, Dr. Ben Atutu I, I lost him briefly on the on the Zoom connection there. Doc, tell me, I mean, from what you said, from a, a, a political marketing point of view, what does it do to a candidate's brand when, for example, John Mahama, let's use John Mahama because he's the latest uh, to, 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 to alter these words that has been condemned by many. What does it do to his brand, for example, when you, you, you tag him as somebody who uses uh, intemperate language or language that has a potential to incite violence. He said that's not what his intentions are, but you see how, why, why that can, is open to interpretation and can incite others. What does it do to a, a brand, for example? Hello, Doc. Okay, well, we've lost him. Um, obviously, we can't um, uh, challenges with his connections there, but I want to bring back... Uh, quickly, Dr. Amachi, Amachi Boating uh, with me. Doc, do, do, you, do you agree um, with, with Mr. Brian that it appears um, from everything he's seen that all the tiny mi minority of voters care about whether or not their, their leader is, is using incendiary like The overall majority of those who are entrenched in the party and that base, they simply don't care. And so it sort of almost encourages others to just 
use it. The Ghanaian voter, uh, by their silence and dosages. I agree with him. Um, uh, yes. Yes, in the context of the parties, I, I, I agree with him, actually. Uh, I see that as a blind subservience to, you know, party practices, not necessarily the party uh, traditions. Um, you, 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 you come across some developments in the party which openly, uh, simply flout their own rules and regulations, but because the leadership supports it, everybody goes along with it, even some... I mean, the, the, the big men and women in those parties. We've seen these developments in the MPP recently. Uh, it's not a pleasant thing they want you to visit. Uh, you see this also in the NDC. Generally, in the parties, they, 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 they simply don't encourage dissent uh, to the extent that the you know, leader sees things from a particular angle. Everybody must necessarily go with it. And, and, and interestingly, given the fact that when these leaders find themselves in opposition and, and they become sort of frustrated and want to, you know, win political power, come what may, then, you know, they, 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 they lose their hold and begin to use incendiary language. And then everybody follows it. And like it is, those uh, supporters of the parties who come out the loudest, you know, eventually get rewarded. So, yes, in the parties... That is what happens. And let's take note of the fact that when President Muhammad lost in 2016, the NDC acknowledged that it was uh, one of the terrible you know, performances of, 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 of the party. That notwithstanding, he, he managed to pull over 40% of the presidential votes. So yes, these people who actually uh, support such you know, unpleasant languages are in the majority because you, you want, therefore, to believe that the, part, the, the, the two party support base are able to pull over 80% of the presidential so, elections. So, so, Doc, but, so if, 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 if there's agreement that those who support are in a the majority, then this is not going to end. I mean, shouldn't we just accept that this is part of the Ghanaian body politic? And when we should stop pretending we are surprised and condemned because if that is what it is, the majority of people who, because the only thing that uh, the politician reacts to is if it's going to cost him votes. But if it's not going to cost him, but the majority support it, then this, this is not going to end. I was going to move on to, you know, also make this important fact that the party support base of uh, both the MPP and the NDC you know, it's not enough to win them the ultimate uh, uh, elections. So yes, they have majority. Uh, we Ghana has majority of these uh, electorates in the parties. They support their leaders, irrespective of you know whatever it is that they do. But that support is not able to win them the ultimate because of that. You know, everything is not lost. We can't give up. A small minority who happens to be to me the kingmakers in Ghanaian politics. Those people, those people's actions and inactions cause you know the change in 2000, the change in 2008, and and the change in 2012. You know this small minority that is 2016. This small minority, whenever they act, whenever they demonstrate their you know uh, revulsion of whatever it is that the incumbent. Uh, a party in government, you know, is doing, and when they are not satisfied with the governance, and then they act to take the party out of office, the parties go. Their supporters stay with them throughout. To the extent that President Mahama in 2016, you know, uh, was able to pull over 40 percent of the votes, and yet the party felt that you know the performance was terrible. Then you realize that there's something really happening. What it is. You have a small minority who are the kingmakers. And, and if their position is that incendiary languages are simply uh, revulsive, they are not desirable, then definitely Ghana can move ahead and, and work to get it out. Because eventually the parties will come to terms with the fact that, you know, coming out decently matters. And that if you want to win presidential elections these days, you've got to demonstrate to you know, the Ghanaian electorate that you have a plan 
to alleviate economic challenges in the country. Okay, I mean, so let me try again. On, on that point, let me put that to the marketing strategist, the political marketing strategist. Hopefully, he can hear me. Uh, Dr. Tutu Bahene, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Uh, and very briefly, that, from, from a political, strategical branding point of view for a candidate, does it pay to, to have in your brand toughness, a certain toughness, verbal toughness, uh, in, in, in the way you sell yourself, for example, to the electorate. Yes, sir. So, Ivan, thank you. Um, thanks to Suleimana and um, Dr. Akashi Amati for holding the front for me. Um, I think that, you see, when it comes to issues regarding political branding and party branding, um, it is one of the key things in body politics, which is gradually emerging uh, all over the world. And Ghana is no exception. And so when you look at the the the, um, the, 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 the saying that came up with this issue of do and die, uh, which has its um, synonym um, at the other side uh, somewhere in 2012, um, you realize that apart from the branding issue or seated within branding, is issues of culture. And culture to the extent that, you know, within Ghana's uh, culture, language is very key. And it is very key because it determines who you are. Uh, it is key because it brings some kind of respect to you. Um, it is also key because, you know, it demonstrates some level of wisdom um, and knowledge that you have, you know, um, and Above it all, it brings some kind of respect. And so when you come up, especially, you know, with, with a brand, a political brand, and you um, pronounce certain words, you know, the cultural issue now becomes a dominant factor for people to refer to you or to describe you in certain ways. And so you could... Um, 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 the order the die, you know, kind of um, pronouncement, um, sometimes past. Um, the sitting president now um, received some um, bashing from the Ghanaian public, um, purposely because they felt that, you know, as a leader, you don't have to say or pronounce these you know, expressions in public. And then the same thing has also happened. But you see, the question that probably we may want to ask with regards to the branding issue is whether the kind of cultural interpretations that we are giving, you know, to um, the all that we die and then the do and die affair, you know, um, has, has uh, we have actually understood what, you know, these people are saying. Um, Basically, for me, if you look at the analysis, uh, if I look at the analysis behind this expression, uh, I see some kind of, you know, targeting in here. I think that Suleimana and Dr. Uh, Amati Boatin have all indicated, you know, that the communication itself has its own target, and there is no two ways about it. That when you listen to what President, uh, ex-president Mahama said, he was actually not talking, you know, to uh, some people which in marketing we will refer to as unintended audience, but he was actually uh, talking to his base, that is the party's base, mm. and he was using that platform, you know, to get to them. And so, with issues of branding, he is mm. actually you know, reinforcing his brand, you know, within his political cycle. And that is a party following. Yeah. Um, which, which, is, which, is, which, is, which is the point that um, I want to return to when I come from this break. Because I, so how do you deal with this? I wonder, is the moral conscience of society still at, at fault here? So we've had this latest pronouncement. We've had previous ones. We are yet to hear condemnation, say, from the clergy. I mean, and when they do, 
we know they are going to be attacked. So sometimes they don't want to get into that. Civil society, um, apart from Suleiman Abraima, I, I haven't heard anyone else uh, putting their heads out to, to call this out. Uh, we have the Peace Council, which has been pretty quiet on this as well. All these, um, I guess, civil uh, parts of our society, are they complicit in what we're seeing? And from, clearly from what everything I've heard tonight, this is on the ascendancy. It's becoming almost an accepted, normalized part of our body politic. Is it time for the moral conscience of society, civil society, the clergy, etc., to take a more tougher stance against this going forward? Um, I guess we'll win after the break. And my guest, uh, Suleiman Abraima, uh, Dr. Uh, Amachi uh, Boating, and uh, Dr. Uh, Bernard Tutu Boating. Um, Mr. Abraima, so let me ask you, do, do you think it's time for the moral conscience of society, civil society, clergy, um, the likes of the um, peace councils of this world, to take a tougher stance on these matters, they, and that their silence may be, is contributing to how this is becoming a pretty accepted part of our body politics? Well, I, I think it is important that we, we standardize our intervention and be consistent in the way we do things um, so that when we take a decision that something is wrong, it's wrong at all times, irrespective of what time it happens and who does it. Um, uh, again, this whole thing about um, verbal assaults and verbal violence, as I would call it, uh, is not just used by politicians against politicians. It is also used by politicians against civil society actors, against journalists, and so on and so forth. But, well, that's the work that we've chosen to do. And I think that it is important, unless, you know, groups like the Peace Council, the religious groups, don't see anything wrong with the statement that was made by um, President Mahama. Of course, they've, they've explained that it is an idiomatic expression. And indeed it is, if you look at the literal meaning, but in, in our politics, what is important is what is the ordinary man's understanding of the statement? That is what is important. And I believe that the ordinary man's understanding of that statement is that, look, whatever it takes to win, even if it means that we must be violent, we have to be violent. And it is to that extent that I think that, um, you know, people of conscience, organizations of conscience and you know, those that we all look up to must, must speak up so that together we can take a consistent position on these matters. Mm. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me. Just run out of time on this. We pretty return to this pretty, uh, matter again. I'm pretty sure uh, in the course of, uh, we are all, we had what, three years plus away from the elections and already these matters are coming up. Suleiman Abraham and his organization only do the tracking very close to the elections, but as you can see, it started already.